I want to start by asking where you were on Saturday when this terror attack began. It's a great question because it's kind of like 9-11. I will never forget the second that I heard that Israel was in this unprecedented war. I went to synagogue, actually. I keep the Sabbath in a way that I turn off all electricity and I don't check my email or listen to the radio or go online. And so it was 12 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and I went to synagogue with my kids like I always do. And when I arrived, I right away knew that something was off. Um, and I'll never forget my friend Inbal came up to me and she, I guess she could see on my face. She said, yeah, I guess you don't know. Israel's at war. There are communities captured by Hamas terrorists. There are dozens at that point. We didn't know it was over a hundred said dozens of captives taken. And it was a moment like, like how I'll remember for the rest of my life where I was on 9-11 that I will remember forever. I mean, I can't imagine what was going through your heart and your mind. And we have seen stories that are so horrific and they continue to come out of what has happened as a result of this terror attack, what is currently happening. How are people, and I know this is a complex question, but how are people faring right now inside Israel as they grapple with the details and the loss? I think it's really important to realize that for all of us, this is personal. There's not anyone here in Israel that doesn't have a loved one who was affected in one way or another. I have two cousins and a few nieces and nephews who have been deployed. Um, my neighbor's son, who was killed in a war many years ago, her grandkids are all now on the front lines. One of the fellowship's partners, the head of the Eshkol region, which is on the border of the Gaza Strip, the head of uh, the head of welfare there, we text messaged all of our partners immediately to say, how are you? What can we do to help? And two blue checks came up on the WhatsApp, which means that it was delivered. But then we found out it was delivered to Hamas because our partner was kidnapped. She was taken to the Gaza Strip. And so for all of us, this is personal. And I can go down for the next hour a list of all the ways I'm personally affected. But thank God my family is safe. We are at not directly affected. And so you have to praise God for every miracle, but we are all in Israel in a state of shock and mourning. Yeah, I wanna get into the some of the work that you're doing. Uh, before I do, I wanted to ask, why do you think Hamas has chosen this time right now to do this? The great question. I, I believe that everything is spiritual, Billy, and I believe that they chose the Sabbath to attack on when they know that we're trying to enjoy that day of peace, that day of rest. It was also the holiday of Simchat Torah, which is the day that literally translates into rejoicing with the Torah. Um, I think they choose the day of spiritual joy in order to bring as much destruction as possible. And I go back to the Bible and I see, oh, Ave Hashem Sinura, lovers of the Lord despise evil. And I think evil are those that don't believe in, don't follow the outline of the Bible to love your neighbor, to respect life. When we see babies beheaded, when we see women and their children being taken as hostages and raped, it's something that this is the epitome of evil. Yeah, and, and I one more question about just the general reaction to this, because one of the things that has been very disturbing to watch, even in some U.S. cities, are people taking to the streets, and I know you've seen this, chanting, saying horrific things about Israel and the Jewish people, supporting, I mean, there are images out there supporting these attacks, essentially. What is it like, you know, the frustration level of experiencing what you're experiencing and seeing these pockets of people who are out there across the world saying these things? It is so disturbing, but it's not surprising. I am the granddaughter and daughter-in-law of Holocaust survivors. I never lose sight that anti-Semitism is a form of hate that has not been destroyed and that can rear its ugly head in a second, that we have done such an incredible job at making it in some ways taboo and having most of the free world know that if you stand for freedom, you stand with Israel and against anti-Semitism. But unfortunately, there are many people who don't stand for freedom, who don't stand for godly values. And so as soon as you have that, what they stand for is anti-Semitism. So it's disturbing to see, but it's not surprising to see. 
And, and fortunately, the reaction to that is most people are absolutely horrified when they when they see that, as you were saying. And I do want to get into the work that the fellowship is doing right now because there are needs on the ground. You are meeting those needs. Can you take us through some of what you've been doing since Saturday? Well, the fellowship is the first responders of Israel. During times, it's not times of peace, it's time of quiet in between wars. So we always say that's our opportunity to prepare for the next war. So first of all, everything that we've done in Israel to prepare for this war is now being used. Thousands of bulletproof vests, helmets, uh, bulletproof um, vehicles for first responders, bulletproof ambulances, a hospital, Barzilai Hospital in Beersheba, which had a direct hit, at least one, can't talk about more yet, um, but one confirmed direct hit. The fellowship uh, secured their NICU and labor and delivery unit. We provided them with MRI machines. And so What's important to realize is since 2006, that was the second Lebanon war, when for the first time the the home front was under attack. The war zone wasn't overseas, but rather it was in Israeli homes. The fellowship has been doing everything to build over 4,000 bomb shelters, everything to prepare for when there's war, that the people of Israel be protected. And so there's that cumulative effect that's saving lives now, but then there's also what we're doing now. Um, we have connections in every single city who we work with on a regular basis. And so since Sunday, that's the first day of war when nobody had anything clear of what was needed or what was going on. We were going bomb shelter to bomb shelter, bringing food. We were going to first responders, being, bringing bulletproof vests. Those people whose homes have been hit by direct rocket attacks or burned down by terrorists, were already there providing them with everything they need because they they escaped with nothing but the clothes on their back. Many of them literally came without shoes. They don't have a toothbrush. Their cars were burned and they don't even have a credit card. Like These are people who are going from living normal lives to not even having a credit card, shoes, or a car. And so the fellowship has been there since Sunday, side by side, everything they need. And of course, on top of that, we're working with the authorities. The National Home Front Command asked the fellow to shut fellowship to set up at every location where people are going to identify the bodies of loved ones. And there are many because there are thousands of bodies. The fellowship is there with a tent just to provide water, snacks, coffee, chairs. This came as such a surprise to the government of Israel that we're there providing these basics because otherwise they wouldn't be there. It is, it's such a horrific situation and you're on the ground doing all these wonderful things that you just detailed. For you personally, I know when these sorts of things happen, you you plug through, you get the work done. How has this, what you've seen from the people you just described, the people who are hurting and suffering, what, what has most affected you personally and emotionally? Wow. Um, I think seeing people who we've worked with who were in the position of strength and helping for the past 15 years, who are now the victims. I'm tearing up just thinking about it. These are people, the municipal social workers, the mayors, the first responders, who were the ones going to people's homes who were hit by rockets. They were the ones comforting those who were in mourning. They were the ones who were going and bringing food shelter to shelter. And now they're coming to us and saying, my son was killed, I can't function, or my house was hit, I have nothing, or, I, there's only one social worker in the city of 900 people, and there are 200 people in that city dead, and there's a law that a social worker can't go alone to alert the families that their loved ones have been killed. So we have to send fellowship volunteers to go with the social worker to tell their own people in their community that hundreds of their loved ones have been killed. It's seeing people who were in a position of giving and strength forever suddenly transform into the victims. And it reminds you that it could happen to anyone. It really could happen to anyone. As we round out to a close here, you know, the world is watching this right now. And I think a lot of people have so many questions about so many different elements of this. And there's the pain and the suffering that is so palpable for so many around the world who are feeling the impact and really sympathizing with what unfolded there, what would your message be? And I know this is a broad question, but I do want to give you a chance. Your message to the world as people are watching this and trying to make sense of what's unfolded. I think people forget that Israel is in the Middle East. And even in Israel, we forget. What we saw was an attack 
that ISIS does, that Al-Qaeda does, and these are Israel's neighbors. We might have been uh, finished with our official war of survival in, by, nine, eight, by 1949, but we are still fighting every day for our survival. The war that we are fighting right now, and just yesterday, three out of five of our neighbors fired rockets at us. We are a country the size of New Jersey. We are a country with only 10 million citizens, and 2 million of those citizens are Arab, Muslim, Druze, Bedouin. We are a country that is in a fight for our survival, and it doesn't happen overnight that we win. So I just pray that the support that we're feeling now will continue until we no longer face this threat of our children being taken to the Gaza Strip. Final question for you. There are people who might want to help out. They might want to get involved in some way. Where can they go to support the fellowship? Thank you so much. The fellowship and our incredible staff are working day and night. We look at this as our reserve duty. We look at ourselves as soldiers on the social front. And so every penny literally helps to bring a meal to the bomb shelter, to bring uh, shoes to those who have been affected, to bring bulletproof vests to the people fighting on the front lines. If you want to help, you could go to www.ifcj.org and immediately those funds will get to the field. I so appreciate you taking the time today and we'll be praying for you and the people of Israel. Thank you so much, Billy. Thank you.